what you gonna do when the words coming for you? Hide what you gonna do when the truth's coming for you? Hide what you gonna do when the words coming for you? Hide what you gonna do? Tell me what you gonna do. We don't rap for money, we rap for Jesus. Most rap for the limelight, trying to be rich. Some they sold for next to nothing, chasing vanity. Every word profanity, heading for fatality. Need to be reborn by confession in Christ. Need to be transformed so you can have life. After you die, you gon' stand before the Lord. Eternal life on one side, the other side, the swarm. You get truth every time you spit it. Get lies every time you turn on your radio, TV or DVD. It's not me, Holy Spirit. I didn't write my lyrics. It was God that moved on me, like a game of chess. I'ma be with Jesus when I. I die in the flesh, you heard the truth, so ask yourself what's next. We bounce like bad checks on these beats. Everybody get on your feet and give God the glory, yeah. So yeah, guys, so um, Book of Matthew, we're going to wrap up probably chapter four today. We're going to do our very best to do that. Um, hey, before you start, sir. Ron, I want to I say something from last week, if it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is. Yeah. Um, I want to. I just want to clear up a few things. One thing I wanted to clear up last week is that um, when I was talking about Joel Osteen, I didn't say it right. I said when he was on Larry King, Larry King asked him, Do, "Does he believe Jesus is the only way?" And he denied that he was the only way. He said he had Buddhist friends and Hindu friends, and he also believed they can come to God by what they do, which is heretical. And this guy got over a million parishioners. You know, that gave him, we talked about it last week, that gave him 100 million in the past 20 years and more because he had to live off of that money. So he made more than that. And people give their money to these type of teachers, you know, and then they blame God, you know, when they find out they got deceived. But guess what? If you got your own Bible, if everybody has a Bible, there's no excuses. Me and Ron was talking about that this morning. You have to do your own homework, guys. You don't have to take everything I say as fact or law, the purpose of everyone having their own Bible and reading, and it's, it's supposed to be conf the confirmation, meaning the scriptures is not under under any one private interpretation. It should, it, should be, it, should be, it should be people on the other side of the world believing and teaching identical what we're teaching. See, most cults, their teachings generated from one person to a couple of persons to around the world. But there was no confirmation. That's what it means under one private interpretation. If you look at Jehovah Witnesses, their teachings come came from a man by the name of who? Charles Taze Russell. Uh, uh, Mormonism, Joseph Smith, directly from him. Even Mohammedism came from Muhammad, you know, and stuff like that. And most of these guys, the teachings come from one person. But the scriptures, again, should not be un under any one's private interpretation. It should be somebody on the other side of the world confirming and believing identically what we believe around, not just the world, wherever, you know? So I just wanted to say that. And also, you know, again, he denied that Jesus was the only way. Amen. He didn't believe that, which was a, you know, that's that's um a crime against scripture, against that scripture we read last week. You know, and that's basically what I wanted to say. Uh, Ron, I'll pass it back to you. No, uh, amen. Very, very valid points. And uh, yeah, we do apologize if we didn't clarify that. And uh, uh, to be honest with you guys, uh, it's very easy to actually see those live uh, shows. There's, uh, I think you can even Google them up on, on YouTube and you can watch the footage, you know, for yourselves. Uh, but yeah, very valid point. So and since you mentioned last week, we'll, we'll go back a little bit. Uh, Brother Rick, if you're in position, we'll start reading from Matthew. Uh, let me see. Let's go back to, yeah, let's go with chapter, th uh, excuse me, 24. Let's start with verse 30 and um, we'll read through. And then shall appear the sign of the son of a man in heaven, son of man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, 
when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until that till the day that Noah entered the, into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be, two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doeth come. Amen. Amen. Let's we'll stop right there. So let's break, let's dissect this a little bit, guys. There's a couple of things we definitely want to make sure um, we bring to light. Uh, I think one is, uh, we call it the most obvious one. Uh, that I use a lot, uh, that no man does know the day, the hour, nor not the angels of heaven, uh, but only the Father. I think this is very, very powerful for a lot of reasons. I think we highlighted uh, so much, and we're going to continue to do so, uh, how cults love, 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 love gravitating uh, to this uh, period of time. In other words, uh, if I'm correct, the very first introduction that I ever got to the Jehovah Witness was a um, Watchtower magazine that scared the devil out of me, basically saying, repent, repent, the end is near, and uh, the end of the world, I think it was supposed to be 1999, something to that level. No, 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 I was a little younger than that. It was supposed to be in 1980-something. And it scared the living hell out of me. And if you can recall most of their magazines focused around them trying to tell you when the end of the world was going to come. And one of the things I want to make a clear point to is this. Make no mistake. We as believers have a very healthy relationship with the fear of God. In other words, we understand that the knowledge of, of, of wisdom uh, the Bible says the knowledge, uh, uh, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of God, right? And we understand how important it is to have a healthy respect and a fear of God. But we don't go around and, and teach fear, right? We don't go around and try to hijack the ministry and, and scaring people half to death into becoming believers or not. We don't, we don't choose that approach. But that is a, an approach that a lot of cults specifically and strategically try to use uh, to get you into uh, doing something uh, supposedly for God that realistically and technically we shouldn't be doing. So um, some of the names that I'm going to put up here probably may or may not surprise you, but this is a plethora of people who uh, call themselves predicting uh, the end of the world. <laughs> when I saw Ronald Reagan's name up there, I was like, wow, that, that, that's something else. But Reagan predicted in 1989 uh, of course, Marshall Applewhite, we talked about him a few weeks ago. We were talking about cults, uh, that Heaven's Gate cult. Um, Ed Yordan, I'm sure a lot of you guys remember the Y2K's fear that in the world was going to be in 1999. Everyone was buying water and all this type of stuff and guns and food and so on and so forth. So you see, we have a plethora of uh, people, and literally, basically, false prophets. I mean, no, no way to sugarcoat it. These are people who have predicted and called out by dates that the world was going to end on a specific day. Um, Isaac Newton, as great as he was, a physicist, laws of gravity, and all types of science around light. I mean, again, when it comes to the things of God, uh, these men uh, made a mockery of themselves, and not only themselves, but the people who bought into the belief system uh, that the end of the world was coming. So again, I wanted to just make a strong point, right? No one knows the day or the hour. And I love how God even makes it clear to the angels because we all know that the angels have supernatural powers. I like how he put that in there because even if an angel from heaven, remember we saw this in consistent uh, with Paul, it says preaches or teaches another gospel. 
right? Let that man be accursed. So again, this is why it's very important to be in tune with scripture, uh, to be in tune with good teaching, because you're never going to hear contradictory type of teachings here where, you know, we're going to tell you, you can predict this or predict that. That's, that's just not the way it's going to happen here. So that's that. Another point I want to bring out too is that we always talk about pieces having to fit and sacred scripture has to flow a certain way. And this is why we made such a big deal last week when we were talking about, you know, the pieces having to fit and understanding of what we're talking about here in specific. So the second part of the scripture uh, highlights a couple of views that really um, have been heavily debated in theological circuit, circles for, uh, for decades. And that is the a view of the pre-tribulation, uh, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation. And the reason why this also is very, very important is because, like I said on the previous slide, a lot of cults, especially the Jehovah Witness cult, have butchered these things over time. And they've consistently, like others, come in and hijack the teachings of the tribulation period. So what exactly are we talking about when we say pre-tribulation? Um, for those of you not familiar, we talked about the rapture, this being an occurrence that's supposed to happen um, at the beginning of a seven-year tribulation period, the tribulation period that they talk about, that's spoken about in the book of Revelation. And then, of course, um, the mid-tribulation period, um, which is the view that the church will go through the first half of a three-and-a-half-year uh, period, and then being raptured out in the middle of it, uh, avoiding the latter three-and-a-half years. So this is another view that uh, a lot of people hold to, and we'll talk about some of the scriptures where they may be getting this from. But again, we always want to make sure we're clear on understanding how the scriptures are positioned and who God is talking to and what timeline. And of course, the post-tribulation view, the belief that everybody's going to go to this through this uh, horrific period of time, no matter what. So let's get back to one other point. In order to rightfully divide sacred scripture, and we've talked about this uh, over and over and over and over again, and we'll continue to do so. Again, we want to see if today we can apply these techniques to what we're saying. Can we apply the context? To whom is the scripture speaking specifically about? What was the time period again? What were the activities that were pertinent to that time period? And of course, last but not least, we want to have one of these strong, exhausting concordances uh, here in Handley. So, uh, Bishop, you wanted to make note of the way this scripture in particular was talking about um, how two men would be in the field, one uh, would be taken and the other would left. So I know we were going to kind of get to that. Um, did you want me to continue or did you want to highlight that? No, I'll, I'll come in. Um, even in when you said that that when Christ cracks the sky, what blew me away, it said the whole earth shall mourn. Why? Why are they mourning? Right? One thing man does not want to be wrong about, and I'm talking about ungodly man, is that Jesus Christ is real. The Bible's real. He's alive. He's coming back. They don't want to be wrong about it. I speak to some very arrogant people, some very worldly minded people, and they don't believe the Bible. They, you know, one person said the Bible's for poor people, for, for poor people to have something to look to, right? They got all different type of, of things they say about the word of God, but they don't believe it. And it says when, crack, when Christ cracks that sky, the whole world will move. They would be like, oh my God. This is real? He's real? We got an answer? Hell is real? <laughs> the word of God is real. And it says they're going to mourn. Right? That blew me up. I said, why are they mourning, Lord? What are they mourning about? Right? So that's something to think about. But even the word, when it said taken, me and Ron was talking about it. And Ron, you know, he, he, he did a good job. 
Um, but I want to say something else. Ron says something, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and he said something about how the Jews, like the practicing, you know, that their practices were suspended when the when the temple was destroyed, they couldn't continue to practice the way uh, Aaron, Moses and Aaron taught them, so to speak. And, you know, they don't know who's who. And it was kind of suspended. But during the tribulation, they're going to start again, even in the millennium period. Mm -hmm. One thing I love about God is that what we start, he wants us to finish. Mm -hmm. You understand? What we start, he wants us to finish. You can't start something for the Lord and think you're going to stop or think you're going to put your Bible. You know, I, I tried that a few times in my personal testimony. Like, God, this ain't for me. I'm a gangster. I, ain't, I can't do this Christian stuff. And I was a young man trying to come out of my gangster ways. Right. And I said, it ain't for me. You know how many times God made me pick that Bible back up? Mm -hmm. See, when God gives us something to do, you better bet everything. Bet the house on it that you're going to do it. <laughs> You can ask Jonah when you get to heaven, have a conversation with him. When Jonah said, I ain't doing this, I'm out of here. That that will spit Jonah up on, 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 on Nineveh, on the mm -hmm. coast of Nineveh. And Jonah did it. He did it reluctantly. They said Jonah did it with no enthusiasm. A lot of people think Jonah went and preached his heart out. We said this before. He did not. Jonah just went around and said, the Lord is going to destroy this city in three days. Who cares? He didn't. He's mad. And the Bible says that they all repented because it's never about the man or how good we, you know, we, um, we, we good orators or the way we, you know, we preach the word or, you know, wordsmith, so to speak, and how we put our words together. It's about the spirit of God doing what he's going to do. We're just vessels. But at the end of the day, Jonah had to do what God told him to do. And it's the same thing there. They're going to do it. Even though Christ came and they don't need, we said the day of atonement anymore because Christ gave his life, but you're going to go do and do it exact, exactly the way I wanted it done in the first place. God always makes sure, that's the point there, that we finish what we start, <laughs> right? He always does that. So if you think you're going to put your Bible down or give up or think you're going to run back to the world and think you... Uh uh. If God truly called you and He has an authentic calling on your life, you ain't going nowhere. Amen. God has shut your whole world down before He let you think you're just going to give Him your back, back or your butt to kiss and go on with your life. It doesn't work like that. It does not work. Um. Secondly, I want to say that um, uh, I was looking at taking, right? And it's about. What you got to understand, we said this before, one English word could represent about seven or eight Greek words, right? One English word could represent about seven or eight Greek words. There's about seven, maybe seven different words. A little, maybe seven, I didn't count it. Seven, I counted it, looked about seven or eight different words for taken in the Greek that we just translate taken. But the Greek has seven unique words for it. And the word they use there. It's not, there's, a, there's one word that means to take up or to like take away. That's not kind of the word there. That word there means to take, to take charge of, meaning when you take charge of somebody in Jesus's day, it means he gave him to the, to the police officers and the police officers came and they took charge of him. They, they mean they arrested him or they, it's always used. They said that word is used with like, with that of judgment. A lot of people you know, looked at that like as a rapture, like one more, one person uh, was raptured and the other person wasn't. But they said, no, nah, that's it means that that some one's going to be taken, but taken in judgment, not taken like the rapture. That's what they argue, because that word is kind of has a, 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 a you know, a, a twist on it where it's just it's, it's tied into to somebody taken into judgment where there's other words that. Uh, the New Testament writers could have used to be taking away like the rapture, but it's not there. It's, that word is uniquely different. So they don't run with that. Like where people say, oh, see, that's the rapture there. See, one is being raptured, but they, they argue that that's not saying that. So again, like we said in the beginning, you got to do your own homework. You got to make sure this stuff, you know, you can take what I say, but God don't want you just doing that. 
You know, you got to search the scripture to make sure what we're teaching is correct. That's that's on you. You can't never tell God nobody deceived you when you got your own Bible. That's all I want to say. Amen. As we say, no ignorance above the law, right? When the, when the rules are readily available and accessible to you. Amen. Powerful point. And, and just to kind of piggyback off of uh, what, you know, what Bishop is really alluding to is that, again, a lot of what's going on here between these two views um, really comes out of a couple of things. One, again, not understanding, you know, context. And of course, like always, um, you always have uh, a cult or the evil one, you know, who's always there trying to strategically send God's people into a tailspin. And again, that's that's the whole purpose of a strong group, strong Bible believing group to really offset that from happening. Um, so as we move forward and we'll get back to that a little bit more, let's talk a little bit about that in particular, the setting of Matthew uh, chapter 24. So let's make no mistake, as we opened and we talked about this last week, we didn't read that this week, but notice that they're coming in the beginning of 24, they did basically coming from the, the temple and the apostles are, are admiring the building uh, of the temple. Uh, they're so excited that, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at the splendor of the temple. And, and realistically speaking, I'm going to tell you what's going on in their minds. Like most people, they have this view of their position in Christ. And again, it always comes around what their perception was. And even though these men were with God for three, three and a half years, they still weren't immune to uh, the thoughts, their human attributes. In other words, the, the human side of them struggling with the way they perceived the Messiah to be. Remember, these were people that were going through uh, horrific times, just like we all know, we've talked about the Roman opposition. And we talked about a lot of the things that was dealing with them. That's why we always uh, constantly preach, don't become a byproduct of your of your generation, but we know that the generation is always lurking around. Um, we know that in this context, when Jesus was talking to them about the temple, he was speaking to them in a literal sense when he said to them, I surely I say to you, not one stone will remain. Uh, this building, I'm telling you, right? This building will be destroyed. He wasn't talking about any other uh, building. He wasn't talking about any other temple, right? And he was talking about something that would happen literally in that generation at the hands of that government who happened to be uh, the Roman government, right? Another thing I want to highlight about that too, and we kind of alluded to that a few minutes ago when Bishop was talking about the removal of the temple. And like I said, this was affecting the Jewish community. That, that temple was everything to them, right? It wasn't everything to the Gentiles, right? It wasn't our end all and be all, right? From a Gentile perspective, while I'm sure they admired the temple, they weren't even allowed to practice uh, anything in that temple. So this is, again, how we're able to take from the context that Jesus was talking to the Jewish community, period. No answers or buts about it, right? And again, um, we see where Jesus is constantly reminding his disciples even though they had their concept of what Jesus was. And I think we said that recent, uh, also, how we believe that there was a zealot amongst them, you know? And like, you know, if you got anybody in, in your group that's kind of whispering in your ear and sharing things, so I'm sure they struggle with the fact that, you know, they thought this Messiah probably had some feelings like, come on, Jesus, I know you're gonna take these Romans out, right? I know you're gonna do these things, right? Uh, how do we know that? We, we remember when Jesus had shared with them that he had to lay his life down and he had to die. And Peter uh, said, never, Lord, never, Lord, right? And Jesus rebuked him, said, get thee behind me, Satan. So we know that the apostles constantly, whether it was every day, but I'm sure it's obvious that they struggled with what was going on socially. And, you know, we as um, you know, African-Americans uh, on this uh, call Bible study, I'm, I'm sure we can relate to that, right? We uh, have struggled with a lot of social oppression, you know, people of color. So it's very challenging, right, for people of color, and I'm speaking to myself, to keep sacred scripture separate 
from the issues of the day, right? I, I used to, as a young African-American man, I struggled with a lot of that, right? And so as I started learning the word, I would use more so of the word of God really to kind of uh, benefit my social circumstances. And until I got in a strong, you know, Bible study group, I, you know, I was rebuked of that. But in, in my younger days, I'm like, you couldn't tell me no different, right? I felt that the social changes that I went through, the way I was treated, you know, couldn't get decent jobs and things that were happening to us and, you know, pulling us, uh, stopping and frisking and all these types of things. But I had to be reminded that, yes, those things are happening, but we are here to bring the gospel of the truth of Jesus Christ. And I'll say this to say this, that if we were to follow the gospel, the truth of the gospel, a lot of these social ills and circumstances would pretty much be non-existent if people were truly uh, following the teachings of the gospel, which we know, obviously, they are not. So here's something that I thought about that would kind of make things a little bit more concrete and why I believe that in this particular text, we have to look at what Jesus represented in that time that he's speaking, right? So we know Jesus is coming to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and, 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 and this is where he's, he's laying it down. Paul, we understand, came to the Gentiles. So when you look at this particular scripture here, Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, when Jesus is speaking, he's talking about sending the angels, the great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. We, uh, Brother Rick eloquently read that a few minutes ago. And then in here, in, in 24, like we were saying, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other will be left. Two men, women grinding with the hand mill. What I'm saying is this, the apostles wouldn't have had, at this time, any idea whatsoever about the plans of the Gentile church. The person who would be talking more so about what's going to happen with the Gentile movement would be Paul. So when you look at Paul's scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, when he's speaking, there's very similar tonality between verse 16 and verse 31, because you see the shout of the trump. But in particular, verse 17, when it says, then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, right? There's that difference of wording, not, not taken, but caught up in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So what am I saying? I'm saying in so many words that Paul's uh, scriptures in Thessalonians is speaking to the Gentiles, right? There's no dispute whatsoever that this is clearly talking to the Gentile church. In Matthew 24, 31, Matthew 24, 40, 41, we know Jesus is not speaking to the Gentile church. We know that even though at that time, some of the apostles would later on, and you'll see where I'm going with this with, with John, because John later on down the line, obviously was preaching and teaching to the church. But at the time when Jesus is sharing this in Matthew 24, this is not the same St. John that you see over here with the book of Revelation coming to him and him writing on the island of Patmos somewhere in 90, 95, okay, about 1979, which we believe is clearly talking about the church. And so this is a small sample size of how we go through each scripture, breaking down timeline, who's the audience, and the circumstances around. In other words, the circumstances around Jesus talking to the apostles outside the temple on the Mount of Olives hadn't happened yet. It didn't happen in Paul's uh, uh, gospels. It didn't happen in John's gospel. It hadn't happened yet. The church age hadn't happened yet because we know that the church age wasn't technically ushered in until after Jesus' death and resurrection. So this is again how we are able to see that Thessalonians, yeah, that's talking rapture. Revelation 19, 7 through 9, yeah, that sounds like rapture language. How do we know that? Because here's the thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It says, let us be glad and rejoice, giving honor to him, for the marriage of the lamb is come. So we know who's the bride of Christ. 
the church. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. See, we know that in order for this to have to, for us to be in this position, that God had to come back, claim his church, claim his bride, right? Do those things first, right? And then what he's talking about in Matthew 24, um, 31, this is now when Jesus is coming back after he has his, his bride. And now he's coming back to do business on the earth. In other words, the bridegroom ceremony has to happen before these things happen with the uh, uh, rapture. Um, Bishop, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say that now there's a few arguments now, um, Pastor, that some people argue that Israel is the bride of Christ. That's an up in the air. There's certain scriptures that will point to Israel. Uh, the bridegroom and the bride, if you see that in the Gospels, right? Yes, yes. Um, so some people say it's the church, some people, that right there is a theological discussion you have to do your own homework on. I'm not mandating that. Um, um, when I looked at the argument, I might sway a little bit to Israel myself. Uh, that's in my personal convictions. But my point is this, right? One of the main reasons why I believe the church is going to be raptured before the time we're reading now in chapter 24. There's a few reasons it, my convictions are locked on, right? That my convictions are locked on. My convictions are locked on because, um, one, um, like we said, there's no two temples existing at the same time. Uh, uh, Paul said the restrainer in Thessalonians have to be taken out of the way. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in, you know, the body of Christ right now. He's the one keeping the world from going to the brink. He's the one, the body of Christ is keeping the world from really just, you know, self-destruction. So that has to be moved out of the way before the Antichrist can really do his thing. And that's why one reason I believe the church has to be removed before the tribulation period. Right. Another reason is um, if you look at, look at Revelations. Now, let me say this. The power of the gospel is the simplicity of the gospel. Look at Revelation. John comes on Revelations. Like he said, he wrote that on the island of Patmos. Uh, tradition says that I forgot what Caesar kept trying to kill John. I don't know if it was Nero or the one right after him. They kept trying to kill the apostle and couldn't do it. And they got so scared of him. They exiled him, put him on. Because, you know, God wouldn't let him die. He had to write Revelations, right? Amen. And when he wrote Revelations, he comes out firing. And the first four chapters, maybe three and a half, is church, 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 the church, the church. After that, the church disappears. He never uses the word again. He only focuses on Israel. The church just disappears. In mm -hmm. chapter four, I believe they said there was a host of all tongues of all nations standing around the land praising. I believe that's the church. But then he goes into, you know, we start uh, reading last week. We was talking about um, uh, uh, the 144,000. And all he talks about from that moment on is Israel. He never mentions the word church again. Mm -hmm. Where did the church go? What happened to the church? So that's another reason why I believe the church will be raptured. Little things like that locks my conscience to believe them. In the, not just because I hear people say it and I hear strong arguments on it. Scripture, as I read scripture, I'll be like, well, that's a good point. Well, where the heck is the church? Well, why he never uses the word again? Mm -hmm. And people in all that theology trying to prove a mid-trib or whatever, they can't answer that question. They try to, but they can't. So little things like that keeps me kind of grounded in believing that the church will be raptured and Israel will have to go through the tribulation period and realize who they have pierced and who they sentenced to death and who they turned their back on all these years is definitely their Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And that's all I want to say. Mom, so. Amen. And, and I like what you're saying because it, guys, these are uh, legitimate debates. And, and like a Bishop said, they're, are uh, arguments and arguments upon arguments that surround these three points of views. Again, when we share this information, like I said, again, 
it's it's from a conviction. Um, I'm sharing it with you in ways that you see how we come to uh, these conclusions that they're all, you know, scripture based. Nothing's really now they are they'll, there'll be some hunches here and there. But again, we that is going to be uh, said in the beginning. Right. That's what you feel like in our sanctified minds. We, we see something there. That's 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 for sure. But one thing we can't deny is that the Bible is very clear uh, in certain contexts of who, what, when, where, and how uh, God is moving. So we have to make sure that um, we're very aware of how we're rightfully dividing uh, these scriptures. Uh, Brother Mike, I'm sorry, did you want to come in? On All right, so moving right along, uh, good stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and pick up Brother Rick with verse 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made rule over his household, to given them in meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. You can stop right there. So what is what is all of this coming to? Full head, right? And, and there's a couple of things that I really like from this scripture too. I just wanted to uh, also make something note of noteworthiness too. There, and we said this before, but there's going to be judgment. There is a judgment that's coming, right? Nothing that's happening now is going unnoticed from the watchful eye of Jesus Christ. And understand this, and I know we say this a lot, we, you know, when that sky cracks, you really want to make sure you are on the right side of God's peace, guys. I mean, this is serious stuff. And it is these types of scriptures that really push me and motivate me to share the truth of the gospel because I'm going to be honest, there's a part of us, and I'm not sure I'm the only one out here confessing this, that just says, you know what, God, I'm sick of these people, <laughs> you know, just come on, deal with these people and get it on and get it over with, right? And, you know, a part of me struggles with that. Um, but then again, I say, no, you know, you came and you saved me. What if somebody had said that about me, you know, then I wouldn't be here, you know? So again, that's, that's a real struggle that we deal with uh, if we're being real and true to ourselves. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we understand that God has a strategic delay that's in place. This is not accidental, uh, but at the end of the day, guys, something that we said earlier that we don't pre preach and peddle fear, but make no mistake, the Bible says, don't fear someone that can kill and destroy the body, right? You feel somebody fear the Lord who could destroy the body and the spirit. In other words, for eternity, right? So these are the types of things that keep me, you know, on my A game when it comes to preaching the gospel. Um, but I like how this scripture makes reference to, guys, being on the lookout. And I think by doing our due diligence, bringing the word of God, sharing the word of God, it keeps us in position to stay watchful to stay ready, you know, because in sharing the gospel, that means you have to stay aware of the signs. We talked about that last week, being aware of the signs of the times. We talked about things going on, you know, in this country. We talked about things going on politically. We talked about things going on biologically. We talked about things going on economically, right? Being aware of the signs. And as believers, yes, there should be a certain level of expectation that we should all have, meaning that we clearly understand what's going on, right? No question about it. 
And then more importantly, being in absolute sync with what's going on, you know, with what God is absolutely doing. Uh, too many times you see people that are out of sync and you ask themselves, where, where are they sitting? What scriptures are they reading? What, what community of believers are they in? They're so off the wall, right? And so we have to stay consistently in sync with what God is doing. You know, we can't allow charismatic people to, to lead us off the trail because we talked about that a little earlier when we were talking about uh, Joel Osteen. Uh, and then again, keeping your head in the scriptures, keeping your head locked and loaded in what God is doing. And like we said, you know, reading like we did and looking at this information and trying to really get it right, you know, understanding of, is God talking about how is he breaking down the rapture? Is the church going to be raptured? You know, is he talking to Israel? You know, what's going on with the temple? You know, staying aware of these things will keep the enemy at arm's reach. Now, it says, if possible, you know, he would try to fool the very elect, if possible. But I'm going to say it's not possible when you're moving by the voice of the Holy Spirit, when you're staying in, in the word, right, and you're staying insulated and in people who believe in who are serving God the right way, you're insulated against these types of attacks. And then last but not least, like you said, in the days of Noah, uh, you know, you got to be ready, got to be ready to spring into action, got to know what to do, right? Uh, you know, people like Brother Rick and myself that live in these areas with hurricanes and tornadoes, you know, there's certain things that when we hear, we know what to do. We know how to prepare our house. We know how to get things we need, batteries, water, things like that, radio, you know, because uh, it won't be no internet, but just being ready, you know, to spring into action and, and do what we're supposed to do, you know. Uh, I like something that uh, they taught me uh, on the railroad. They said, uh, and Brother uh, Buford could probably attest to this too. They say they don't pay us this kind of money uh, when we just running trains up and down, right? Easy peasy. They said they pay us the money they pay us. So when there's a derailment, when something goes wrong, a fire breaks out, uh, there's a criminal on board, you know, things of that nature. That's where we earn the money that we earn. And so when things go wrong, right, we're ready. Because as Brother uh, Buford could tell you, there's probably been 20, 30, 40 days without an incident, right? But when that incident comes, you have to be ready. You have to be ready. So, um, so yeah, that's the kind of uh, stuff that we, we're trying to share here. Uh, and hopefully um, we are making some sense out of that. But um, that's all I have for you guys today. The floor is open, guys. Um, share if you dare. Um, floor is open. Amen, brother. Praise the Lord. Uh, great job today with the word. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed it. I, I think that I'm just, you know, just to add and come behind you guys. Really, what's profound about this chapter is that. Jesus Christ, is, his audience is Jewish, which you stated so eloquently, you know, Brother Cal, we know he's, he's speaking to Jews, the church age starts after Calvary, we know that. But what's profound is that he's telling his disciples this conversation, right? He's telling them all of these different truths that's really going to go past their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. The powerful mm -hmm. thing about what Jesus is doing is he's telling them things that, that they, like, they, they all know, we know they were martyred, they laid their lives down, but a lot of this hasn't happened, hasn't occurred, but he's telling them things before, you know, that's, that surpasses their lifetime. And the question is why? Why is Jesus telling his disciples about end time prophecies? I think one, because he's, his ministry is about to come to a climax soon in the next couple of chapters. And two, he was preparing them for their ministry. One thing about God's word, he prepares us for our ministry. He didn't want them all wrapped up in their culture. He didn't want them blindsided. He didn't want them caught up in the temple. He wanted them to be ready for their ministry. This mm, is really amen. about preparing, preparing the disciples for their ministry. You know, and if not preparing y'all for ministry, then we're wasting our time on this call. Everything mm -hmm. Christ was doing at that time was to prepare them to preach the gospel and lay their lives down, giving their testimonies in blood. And I think he, I believe he climaxed this by Calvary because Calvary and him being resurrected 
it really, really brought it out 3D. They was ready for ministry after 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 he was shared in them the end time prophecies and these things that would take place, and then he laid his life down after that. They were ready for ministry after this. See, God is powerful. He gives us the word and he gives us experience, so we'll be ready to take it all away. Mm. One thing about when I first got saved, you know, I had, you know, I read a lot, you know, I studied a lot of the word. And, you know, I was, you know, I was sitting with Brother Cal day in and day out. Go see Brother Brown and we used to go to the Christian bookstores and I, I just downed myself in the word for like the first, you know, I'm just, I'm just so uh, excited about the word and I was reading it, you know, and then I had experiences. I went through a divorce. I went through certain things with Christ. Them things had to work together mm. to give me the full confidence to understand that God is real today. So I believe God was preparing them for their ministry. I believe after this, he laid his life down. We're reading the next couple of chapters to get to the climax of his ministry. But the he let them know he was the Messiah. He told them about prophecy, gave them everything they needed to be caught up in their in their and nonsense and get their, and, and they get distracted to finish their work. And then he laid his life down and showed himself resurrected in front of their eyes. And they realized, okay, we know the future and we know that death has no power. They were ready for ministry after this, guys. Mm. And one thing about every man on this call, we want you guys to be ready to fulfill your personal ministries. That's what this is about. That's what these fellowships about, these Bible studies is about. So Amen. Amen. That's powerful. Powerful point. Very powerful point. Amen. God doesn't want us to be overtaken like a flood when tragedy happens. When things go wrong, you know, we make a lot of plans in our head. We think we're going to do a lot of things. And, we, you know, the Bible said, woe to a man that devises, devises a plan that God doesn't endorse. Right? So when things fall apart, you got to be able to stand. You got to be able to take it on the chin. You know, um, I was watching um, a play. It was a one man play. And it was about John on the island of Patmos, mm. right? And he was by himself, you know, you would think, you know, mentally he was a little, he was old, he was having some struggles mentally, but he wasn't. He'll be, you know, in a good mood and then he'll just get real sad. He'd be like, I miss you, Philip. Oh, Peter. Oh, he would think about things and it would break his heart. He would miss his friends, his loved ones, his family. Mm. He's seen a lot of tragedy. But he stayed, he kept, he stayed the course, he kept the faith. And that's that's what the gospel does. Mm -hmm. See, being on the right side, we, you know, we finished the book, as we said, and it's about technically the book is about being on the right side and the wrong side of God's peace. When you're on the right side of God's peace, you can withstand anything. Mm -hmm. They said Paul was in the dungeon about to be offered up. And he wrote people like he, you know, he was in a penthouse somewhere living mm. life to the fullest. Mm. He said, I have so much exceeding joy to see the gospel going forth and people being saved. This dude was about to be killed by Nero. He was waiting for his day to be beheaded, right? And my point is, is that the right, when you're on the right side of God's peace, those things don't overtake your mind. They don't make you break down and give up when you see something go wrong or when tragedy strikes or, you know, everything is going haywire. It doesn't make you go haywire with it. It, it stabilizes you. It makes you be able to be able to be ready to withstand whatever, whatever the enemy is doing at that time. Mm. Amen, brother. Amen. I love the scripture where it says that, that, um, they were all pulling on Jesus, you know? Oh, come over here, come over here, Lord. Come with us, Lord. And the Bible says he had his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. You know, he was going to Jerusalem to be killed. He was going to climax his ministry on Calvary. And that was his determination. He said, I can't go with y'all. I can't sit down and eat. I can't have a good time. I can't stay. I got to go to Jerusalem. See, when you on the right side of God's peace, God's peace will take you into any situation. And God's peace will bring you out. One thing I want to say, and I want to close with this. Um, I was talking to, I think, Sister Jackie the other day. We was talking about Daniel. And I was looking at Daniel's character because, you know, we quoted Daniel. A lot of this is just the fulfillment of Jesus confirming the prophecy that Daniel, um, the end time prophecies that Daniel was um, speaking about. Jesus was just confirming it. 
But King Nebuchadnezzar, him and Daniel was good friends. He got deceived and he threw Daniel into the lion's den. And he threw him in there. And the Bible said Daniel prayed all night, but Daniel had to go into that lion's den. Daniel was a faithful, devoted man of God. He never questioned God. He never said, God, why I got to go into the lion's den? I've been serving you all my life. I've been faithful. I did everything you wanted me to do. I got to go in this lion's den? Seriously? This is my reward? Mm. But Daniel went in there. And we know the story. They said he he um kept the, the lion's mouths closed, right? I love this scripture, right? Mm. They said King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't even sleep because he loved Daniel, but because of his own decree, he had to follow it and throw Daniel in there, and he felt bad about it, but he, he was the king. He had to do it. They said he ran to the lion then. said, oh, Daniel, did your God deliver you? And this is one scripture that makes me just cringe. He said, oh, King, live forever. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. He wasn't even mad at King Nebuchadnezzar. Even after he threw him in the lion's den, his, his reply was still that of the reply that he did before he went into the lion's den. That's how you greeted the king. First thing you say is, oh, king, live forever. He said it even after that. He said, oh, king, live forever. Mm. He said, yes, my God delivered your servant. Amen. He pulled Daniel out of there and threw all the men that accused him up in there, them and their whole families. And they said them lions tore them. <laughs> Amen. But the point is, he had to go in there. Mm. And his attitude, because he was on the right side of God's peace, he didn't let it bother him. Not only didn't it bother him, he didn't take it person. See, we got to get on the right side, guys. Mm. We have to. That's all I want to say. Amen, brother. Powerful, powerful. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. Um, Brother Rick, pray us out. Brother. What you going to do when the word's coming for you? Ha! What you going to do? Tell me what you going to do. Ha! We told y'all Jesus, Lord. Preach the word real hard like we saw before. Turn around, take your hands, put them right on the wall. Feel the bass from your fingertips straight to the floor. If you're not feeling this gospel, let it bounce you right out the door. For God, we drive hard and we won't be ignored. Mike and Mike with the beats, have your feet in for more. You can search all you want, you can't find it in the store. Cause the music's all Given it belongs to the Lord You can't pay us for what we do What you do Take the gospel, make it free to you What they do You let other people steal from you Now come on Please tell me what the deal with you I'm Trying to find out Hating those keep it real with you Why the hate Hitting you with truth, giving you a clear review Hating on the only word that could deliver you Now what?